Father, would you be pleased now with what you hear and see in our hearts? Would you be so good to continue to open the eyes and the ears of our hearts so we might hear from you this morning? Lord, thank you for your work in our lives. We pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. It's so good to be together this morning. As I came this morning and I've been walking around, I just was reminded of all the men and women who give of their time and their efforts and their energy on Sunday morning to make Sunday morning happen. From those singing upstage, those in the AV booth, to those in our kids' ministry, to those holding babies this morning. So I, I just want to kick off before we jump into the text to just encourage us. I'm so excited about what God is doing at Cornerstone. And part of what he's doing is he's brought you here. And we need you. Last week, we had seven babies in our nursery. That was up from two babies every week before for the last few months. Uh, so that's a huge increase, and we are super excited to celebrate the new life God's brought into our church community. But it means that we need some people who don't mind holding and culling a baby for an hour. So if God has given you a love for holding babies, or just a heart that's willing to do it. I know I was one of those until I had a baby that I felt like every time I held them, they cried. I don't know what it was. I think they knew I was terrified. Um, kids have this, like, babies have a sixth sense, right? But anyways, I want to encourage you. There are ways across this campus that we need you to serve, to help us love on one another, to help us be the community that God's called us to be. And so children's is just one of those, uh, and nursery especially. Um, if you have any interest in that, please let me know reach out to office at cornerstonecbc.org or talk to our children's ministry. All right, well, we're going to jump into God's Word. And if you don't have a Bible with you, I just want you to know we got Bibles on the back table and along the back wall. Grab one, borrow one, take it home with you if you don't have one at home. Because what we are about to do for the next 40 minutes is perhaps the most significant thing we can do with any day of our life, that is, hear from God as He speaks through His Word. And every time I open it, I am reminded that God has not only given us His Word, He has preserved it. And there have been whole governments committed to getting rid of God's word, and yet God has saved it for us. And he saved it for us because he speaks to us through it, and he wants us to hear from him. And so I'm excited that we get to open uh, his word together. All right, well, as we get started, I just got to share with you guys, it is hot. I mean, we knew Houston was going to be hot when we moved here, but we didn't know Houston was going to be hot. It is so incredibly hot and humid, and we have just sort of getting used to it. For the first time in my life, I have discovered that the best time to cut your grass is in that 30 to 45 minutes before it is pitch dark because the only time of day that it's cold is the only time right now that I will ever attempt to mow my grass because it's so hot. It is so hot. Well, as you know, we bought a house at the end of March. We live about a mile from campus or from church, if not less than that. And, um, and we noticed as, as the heat decided to show up one morning in mid-May and never leave us ever, 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 ever again, that that heat will wage war on your house. And, and no matter how much we put our thermostat down to 72, or we left it at 75, or we left it at 78, that house could not keep the temperature, and those, like, the degrees just kept climbing. There was one night we crawled into bed, and it was still 81 in our house, and that AC had been running all day long. And we're like, all right, what's going on? Either we are wimps, and this is just the reality of Houston, <laughs> or, and maybe the former house owners, like, they just, they got used to it, and this is just what life in Houston is like. Or maybe we have an undersized unit, or maybe that thing that nightmares are made of, our AC is about to go out, and we are going to have to buy a new AC system. We just didn't know what was going on, and we were trying to figure out if this was normal. Well, about a month ago, we finally got an AC guy out to check it. Within seconds, he looked at it, and he could tell me, I, I know exactly what's wrong. Give me another 20 minutes, and I'll, I'll show you what's wrong. And so sure enough, about 20, 30 minutes later on his display, he showed me what was happening and really what wasn't happening with our AC system. You see, for those of you who are geeks and engineers and nerds, our AC system's a four-ton unit. It holds just over 11 pounds of Freon. And that day, he put over five pounds of Freon in our system. We were missing half of the thing you need to cool your house. The thing that's been beautiful is ever since, our house can do exactly what we ask it to do. <laughs> it can reach any temperature. It can stay there. And our world has changed. Houston is still hot. Don't get me wrong. But it's not so bad in our house anymore. The other thing that's been amazing to realize is we have saved over $100 in the last month simply because our AC system had what it needed to do its job. Peter is going to remind us that we have gained everything for life and godliness, as he told us last week. Today, he's going to point us to some qualities, some things that we need to grow in to be effective the way we were meant to be effective. 
That like our AC system, when we don't have these things, we can spin our wheels. We can work all day long as our AC unit was. We can look like we've got all the right parts together, but without these things, we become ineffective and unfruitful for Christ. Peter is even going to say, if you don't have these things, you are so short-sighted, you're blind. So that's where we're going to head to. So if you want to start making your way to 2 Peter 1, 5 through 15, that'll be our passage for today. This is the second of two letters that Simon Peter, that we have from Simon Peter. Peter is one of Jesus' closest disciples during Jesus' ministry here. Peter's likely writing from Rome, and it's likely in those two to three years after the great fire of Rome in 64 AD, in which a third to more of the city burned in flames. And Emperor Nero, is, if you know your history, blamed Christians for it. And so he starts killing Christians as a result of the great fire. Now, we don't know for certain. Scholars assume, scholars put pieces together, but we don't know for certainty, so there's some humility here, that both Peter and Paul will be killed under this great persecution. And so what we open today is Peter's last letter. It's a letter written in the last couple of years of his life. And as a result, it's an impassioned letter. We get an old man who has walked with the Lord for years and wants us to hear from him and speaks boldly as a result. Now, you remember that in both letters, we have something very similar. Peter will declare all that God has done, right? This new life we have in Christ, this righteousness we have in Christ. He will fix our feet, our eyes on that. And then Peter will do something else. He will fix us our eyes on the other side of that promise, that we have an eternal life to come. We have an inheritance to come. And, and a result of those two fixed positions, nothing we can do changes what God has done for us in those places. Peter will call us to live faithfully in the in-between. Now, you'll remember from 1 Peter, that call was to live faithfully in the midst of a, a world who doesn't agree with us, a world who opposes the good news of the gospel, a world who not only is surprised when we don't join them, but you might remember the, the verse, they will malign and attack us for following Christ rather than going with them. And so 1 Peter is fixing our eyes on how do we live faithfully in the midst of a world who doesn't agree with us and persecutes us. In this second letter, though, we have a second challenge. The second challenge is now, how do you walk faithfully when the very church of God, the flock of God, is not doing what they're supposed to do? It, it goes farther than that, though. It's not just they're not doing what they're not supposed to do. It's they're teaching things they shouldn't teach. How do we walk faithfully when the pastor and, and the teachers and the, the, the disciples and the people involved in the church leadership are teaching things they shouldn't teach? They're false teachers teaching false doctrine and false heresies. In, in this letter, Peter is very passionate that he would equip us to walk faithfully even in that. Sometimes it's hardest when the people closest to us say things that are wrong and aren't true. Well, we don't, um, and so the tone of this letter as a result is going to be a bit stronger. It's a bit more impassioned. These are people he cares desperately about. It, it may be some influence of a scribe, but I tend to think that this is just, he is near the end and he wants, he's, he's not, He's not yelling at us in an angry way. He's, he's shaking our shoulders and saying, I want you to get this. I want you to remain faithful. Because see, the truth is, even today, we don't have to go far to see heresy taught in the church and to see false doctrine. Whether it's the prosperity gospel taught and proclaimed not too far from here, whether it's the be true to yourself gospel, whether it's the God's going to save everyone, so you don't need to accept Jesus gospel. Whether it's the Jesus is a way, sure, I'll give you that, but he's not the only way, gospel. Or it's one of a dozen other false gospels making their way through our culture and society and church today. False teachings and false teachers are alive and well. We have to be as vigilant as ever. So today we're going to learn that there are some qualities we can put on that we can supplement, as Peter will tell us, our faith with, that we might walk faithfully in the face of those falsehoods and heresies. All right, well, let's dive into today's passage. Hopefully you've made your way there. 2 Peter, verses five, uh, 2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 15. Here we go. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have, I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort, so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. You get a sense of his passion and his eagerness that we would get this. We get some strong words, make every effort. I will make every effort. Be diligent in this. And so let's dive into verses 5 through 7. Peter begins this section with four words that point us back to what we talked about last week for this very reason. You might remember last week in verses 1 through 4 of this chapter, Peter reminded us of all that God has done. He, he packed these full of the truths of God's goodness. You might remember the, the part where in verse 2 he says, God has given us faith. You may remember he used the word obtained last week. It's this Greek word that is something you've received that you've done nothing for. It's like sitting under a beautiful apple tree and, and the best, most delicious apple falls into your lap. You've done nothing to earn it, to receive it, to gain it. And yet you get to enjoy all of its benefits. Our faith, church, is a gift from a Heavenly Father who loves us. And, and then not only that, we can stand before him with equal standing because he loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. Because we stand before him not based off of what you do or what I do or what we don't do, but entirely and exclusively on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so we enjoy equal standing, regardless if we, were, uh, we came to Christ a minute ago or we came to Christ 20 years ago. Our standing before the Lord is exactly the same. Last week, Peter reminded us that as we come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, he hasn't left us to figure this out on our own. He's given us everything we need for life and godliness. And then lastly, from last week, not only have we been given everything we need for life and godliness, we are the recipients of his precious and very great promises. We have received the Holy Spirit that he always promised to give his people. And we have an inheritance that is coming that is a sure promise that will be fulfilled. And so this is what Peter's pointing us back to. He says, for these reasons, for this very reason of all that God has done for you, now supplement your faith. He points us back to the great news of a heavenly father who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God reveals himself that way in Exodus 34, and the rest of the Bible shows us that is true. So for this very reason, because of what God has done, out of gratitude, now make every effort, work really hard, diligently to supplement your faith. Essentially, he's that coach who says, get up and start living in light of what God has given you. Don't lay down, don't sit on the sidelines, get to work. Last week, we talked about obtained, that we've been given this thing we didn't earn. This week, we're called to supplement. This is all about us, actually. This is all about us living in light of what God has done. And so while we do what we're going to do this week, we do on the basis of what God has done, there is work to be done. Peter is going to give us seven qualities or virtues that he's calling us as Christ followers to be intentional about, to thoughtfully add to our lives so that we can be fruitful and effective for Jesus. Now, before we jump in, I want to recognize one quick thing that we can quickly go, or so easily go sidetracked on. Notice that Peter says, supplement your faith. He doesn't say substitute your faith with these things. It's very important we recognize that these virtues and qualities do not save us. We've already been saved in and through Christ. Rather, this is a call to, to out of that salvation, now live for Christ. And if we don't do that, we'll never become the men and women Christ died for us to be. One scholar this week put it this way. He said, we do not simply drift into greater measures of Christ-likeness. There's not a single area in our life where we drift into getting better. I don't learn to love Lauren, my wife, better by drifting into that. It's only through intentionality. I don't learn to love my kids better. It's only through intentionality that I learn to love them better. Similarly, we don't grow in, in leading a team in, in, in the roles that we have if we aren't intentionally trying to grow as leaders. And so this past week, the, the staff team and I, along with a couple of our lay leaders, attended the Global Leadership Summit via live stream with 300,000 of our closest friends spread around the world. We actually don't know any of them. Um, but it is exciting to see 300,000 people in Nigeria and, and Korea and, and France and Argentina all seeking to grow to become better leaders. 
For 27 years, the Global Leadership Summit has spent two days, nearly 10 hours, listening to over a dozen speakers say, here's some things I've learned along my journey that I think might help you grow as leaders. You see, there's a truth that we as the staff have been given an incredible opportunity to, to shepherd, to lead, to care for this congregation. And we will not drift into doing that better. We have to intentionally now supplement the opportunity we've been given to do it better. And so like growing as leaders, Peter's going to tell us that growing as faithful followers of Christ, we have to supplement our faith. There are some things we need to intentionally work at to be the people God's called us to be. And so each of these supplements in these verses, 5 through 7, help us not only remember the great news of the gospel, but they also call us to live differently in light of the gospel. This isn't in the notes. I'm going to ad hoc here for a second. Uh, I turned 39 last year, and I, I thought, okay, you know what? I'm wrestling with the gospel. What does it mean in my life? What does it mean for my family? So I invited some of my best friends over, godly men, and said, okay, guys, what is the, the fact that we were guilty before God, but God in his grace gave us Christ, and out of that we live a life of gratitude? How does that shape the way I love my wife? How does that shape the way I love my kids? How does that shape the way I, I lead at work and I, I love my neighbor? And I will tell you, in a table of eight godly men who love the Lord, that was a hard conversation, harder than I thought it should be, or harder than I thought it would be. Because as Peter's going to show us here, the gospel should shape everything about how we love our wives and our kids and our coworkers. We should live differently in light of the gospel. And so let's take a look at what these things are that we should live differently in as a light, as a light, in light of the gospel. First of all, Peter tells us, supplement our faith with virtue or excellence. This is in light of Christ who, who went all the way to cro the cross for us, who walked in obedience to the Father to his own death for our salvation, we are called to do likewise. The excellence and the virtue here is to do that which is right, not according to our hearts, not according to our world, but according to what God has said is right. And so we grow in virtue and excellence in doing what God has called us to. To follow Christ, to be holy as God is holy, to allow God's word and spirit to transform us into more obedient children of his. We strive to do that which is right in, his, in accordance with his word. Now, as we'll see shortly, and this is important to keep in mind, we will never do this perfectly this side of heaven. And I think that's where we can often not even start the journey. Because I'll never get it right, so why should I even begin? And, and Peter doesn't give us that room. He says, no, 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 no. You start the journey because every step that you get better, you look more like Christ. And it'll get easier and easier. And we'll see that today as well. So the first question for us, church, is are we supplementing our faith with a commitment to excellence and virtue, to walking in the rightness that God has called us to? The second virtue that Peter calls us to is this. We supplement our faith with knowledge. In particular, this is a growing relational knowledge of Jesus and God's word. That we have come to know Jesus, our Savior, so well through his word and through his spirit that we can recognize truth from falsehood. This isn't simply just intellectually knowing the Bible. We all know a lot of very intelligent people who know God's word, but it hasn't changed their life. It's the difference between me being able to tell you what Lauren, my wife's favorite colors and favorite food are, and me actually making decisions based on those truths. It would not be very loving of me to go buy her food she doesn't like, nor to buy her a t-shirt in a color she hates. Now, fair, fair, she does have to give me grace here. I am colorblind, so I often have to ask people, is this the right color? So she gives me a lot of grace in that sense. And the truth is, we get grace everywhere. God is not asking us to get this perfectly for him or for our spouses, but he's asking us to walk in it. So we supplement our faith with relational knowledge, knowledge that we know the person and we live in light of that knowledge knowledge that transforms the way we live. So are we continuing to grow in our relational knowledge of Christ? Is it not just head knowledge, but it's changing the way we live, the way we understand him, the way we walk with our Lord and Savior? The third virtue is self-control. So uh, are we going to supplement our faith with self-control? What does that look like? Well, because we have a new life in Christ and we have the presence of the Holy Spirit in us, we have the power to do something different something that we never could do as non-believers. Uh, Paul tells us that previously we were enslaved to our former sins and, and slaves to that sin, but now in Christ we've been made free. And so all of a sudden, self-control looks very differently for us. We actually have the ability to say no to the things we should say no to and the ability to say yes to the things we should say yes to. Now, uh, let's acknowledge that's not an easy thing to do. That's not an immediate thing we do well because we have a history of saying no to the 
good things and yes to the wrong things. So we have to build some new habits in light of who Christ is and what he's done. And so today in self-control, I say no to the thing I've said yes to for years. And I try. Maybe I don't get it perfectly today, but tomorrow I do it a little bit better. And the next day I do it a little bit better. So we begin to supplement our faith with self-control that is lived in light of the freedom we've been given in Christ. We choose to say no to what is wrong and yes to what is right. And we grow as a result in our gratitude for the freedom that Christ has given us because we recognize we can do that because of him. So church, are we supplementing our faith with self-control, saying yes to the right things and saying no to the wrong things a little bit better each and every day? Next, are we supplementing our faith with, faith with steadfastness? This is the choice to stand firm despite opposition, that somebody's trying to knock us off our feet and we are planted. We are not moving. You see, when we stand up for what's right one day, it's easier to do that the next day. And if we'll do it the next day, it's easier to do it the next day. And we continue to grow in our ability to be steadfast, remain steadfast in our faith. My brother-in-law, Nick, is an Army chaplain. He's attached to the 82nd Airborne Division. He's currently making his way through Ranger School in Georgia. He's made it through the Darby phase. That's the phase where we prove that you can't do this, and it's where they weed out most of the people who are incapable of making it, or they you know, have proven themselves incapable of seeing it through. He's now in the mountains, and I should say he failed that the first time. This is, he's back for his second time to prove that he can do it, and God's called him to. He's now in the mountain phase, and eventually he's going to end up in the swamps of Florida with alligators. He's a much braver man than I. Let's just make that very clear. Um, so he's now in the mountains for 20 days minimum. He's in the mountains with a very small platoon. They will get very little sleep and very meager rations. They will be exhausted and pushed to the extremes of what their human bodies are capable of. And if Nick is going to make it through, he's going to have to be able to persevere under great difficulty with very few resources mentally and physically to keep going. He's going to have to be steadfast. But as we know, with this challenge or with a marathon or anything, you don't remain steadfast in this context unless you've learned to remain steadfast days and months and years beforehand. And the truth is that Nick has spent years preparing for this because he knew God was calling him to it. It's true for us church as well. We will not remain faithful in, our, in following Christ if we don't learn to do it a little bit today and get a little bit better tomorrow. And we will not get, uh, be the men and women God's called us to be if we don't start practicing and intentionally doing that now. We learn to stand for God despite what our world is saying by practicing standing right, standing for God despite what our world is saying. And, and here's the, the future truth, church. We're going to need this more than ever. The, the, Bible, the, the book of the New Testament that uses this word steadfast more than any other book in the New Testament, you can probably guess what it is. It's Revelation. John, in his revelation from God, speaks more about us staying steadfast in the face of difficulty and persecution than any other writer of the New Testament. Things will not get easier for us as Christ followers before Christ returns. They will get harder for us as Christ followers before Christ returns. And so, church, we need to now be learning to stand steadfast fixed, immovable for God, because it's going to get a whole lot harder the longer we're here. So are we, uh, sorry, next we supplement our faith with godliness. This picks up on what Peter told us back in verse three, if you flip back, that through knowing Christ, we have everything we need for life and godliness. We have everything we need to live the life that God has called us to, to be his people in every area of life, but the truth is, we will not walk in this godliness if we don't start trying to walk in this godliness. If we don't refuse to give up when we fail, when we, when we don't get there, because we will never get there if we don't start trying to walk in the life God's given us in Christ. So church, are we supplementing our faith with godliness in the way that we live our lives, in the way that we speak, in the way we interact with our coworkers, in the way we interact with our neighbors and our friends, our family and our spouses? Next, Peter goes on to say, supplement your faith with brotherly affection. This is an intentional choice to love one another and meet the needs of one another, the very specific, physical, tangible needs of each other. The Greek word here is where the city of Philadelphia gets its name, the city of brotherly love. It's a practical love that cares for our needs. It's the idea of, of a love that, that should be attributed to God's people. We have one of our church members who fell yesterday, two days ago, broke her hip. She's in the hospital this morning. 
And so to all of our church members, we're going after first service, and they're going after this service to check on her. She's supposed to move out of her house on Tuesday. So it's, how can we meet that need? How can we come alongside and care for you? That's what we're called to do. You might remember back in chapter 3 of the first letter, Peter wrote that this community of Christ followers is to be defined by several things, one of which is brotherly love. Take a look at 1 Peter uh, 3, uh, 8. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. So church, are we supplementing our faith through a genuine care and love for one another? We're going to have a great opportunity this fall to put this into practice. Because one of the places we live this out as a church is in our home teams. These groups that meet twice a month for food, for fellowship, to pray, to walk with one another, to discuss what God's teaching them. And that's where we get an opportunity to say, what are the needs you have? How can I care for you in practical ways? Now, if you've ever been a part of a small group, you know that we don't do that perfectly even here at Cornerstone. We will strive to continue to do that better. And you are a key part of a home team doing that well by helping your home team do that well. But we grow in this area of brotherly love, of meeting each other's needs. Well, lastly, as if he'd read Paul's uh, letter to the Corinthians, the very final uh, virtue here is the virtue of love. We supplement our faith with love. And this is a love that is even greater than just meeting the needs of somebody, caring for, for their practical needs. It's agape love, defined by two scholars this week in the same way. And they said this, Agape love is not a feeling provoked by the beauty of its object, but rather is a commitment of the heart, of the mind, and of the soul to pursue what is best for the one being loved. Notice that that kind of love doesn't require anything of the one being loved. There is no checklist we, need to give our, we should give our spouses. There is no checklist to give our neighbors, no checklist to give our kids that say, if you meet these things, then I will show you agape love. Now, agape love is the love that shows love regardless of what the other person's doing. This is the love that Peter told us about in his first letter that covers a multitude of sins. Take a look at this in 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. That's agape love. Since agape love, this kind of love, covers a multitude of sins. We are called to love one another in this way, to do it earnestly and to keep doing it even when we don't feel like it, church. We show the very kind of love God has shown us and that love will cover over a multitude of inadequacies and sins and shortcomings. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we can't give up in this kind of love. We have to keep loving earnestly. We can't throw in the towel. We can't give up hope. We have to keep keeping on the truth is we keep loving our spouse even when they say hurtful things about us and to us or in front of us because this is the kind of love that God showed us, that when we rebelled against him, when we were in, dead in our trespasses and sins, he loved us in this way. We keep loving our spouse, though there seems little hope that they would ever change because our hope isn't in our spouse. Our hope is in Christ who changed our lives. We keep loving our parents, our siblings, our friends, despite the choices they make and what they do, because that's exactly how God loved us. Now, I've been here five months of the day. Yeah, I guess so, March 6th, five months of the day. And it has been a joy to get to know this community. But I've now been here long enough to know that some of you are in a very difficult place. You are in the throes of the reality of this. You're at a work where you're not loved. You're in a, in a relationship where you're not feeling like you're loved the way you would like to be loved. You're called to love someone who has hurt you deeply. You're called to keep loving someone who makes it such that it would be so much easier to just walk away and be done with it. Some of you are there, and that's a very hard place to be. It's hard to love others earnestly and sacrificially when it doesn't seem like it'll change anything. And you know what Peter says? He says, keep doing it. Don't give up. Don't stop. Keep loving in that way. Why? Because as you love in this way, it will not only supplement your faith, it will cause you to grow in your love and appreciation for what God has done for you, but your faith will be effective and fruitful. And you have no idea what God might do with that love you show, even when it's not deserved or earned. So church, we're called to supplement our faith with this agape love that God has shown us by showing it to others. So notice what Peter says next in verses 8 through 9. 
For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. If these qualities are yours, if you're supplementing your faith intentionally by trying to add these to your life one day at a time, and they're increasing little by little, they will keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the good news here. It's not about getting these right. It's not about perfecting them. It's not about beating ourselves up because we're falling short in them. It's about are they increasing? Are they growing? Are you committed to bringing these pings into your life as a Christ follower day by day, however imperfectly? Are you striving to grow in these areas to let God's word change your heart and your life and the way you live? And if you will, if you do, you'll be able to stand strong in the face of challenges. You'll be able to find your heart and your mind are stayed on the word of God and the cross and Jesus Christ. Despite discouragement, despite disillusionment, despite distractions that this world will throw at you. However, the other side of this coin is if we choose not to. If we choose to say, well, God did it for me. I'm saved in Christ. I'm just going to live the life the way I want to. We become so nearsighted that we are blind. We might as well be blind or we've missed everything that matters. We've lost sight of the good news of the gospel, of all that God has done for us in and through Jesus Christ. When we don't supplement our faith with these things, when we lose sight of the cross, our eyes will fix themselves somewhere. And my life tells me that if we don't fix them on Christ, they get fixed on us. We get fixed on ourselves, on our circumstances, on our pain, on our challenges, on our frustrations, on our hopes, on the things we're chasing. Those are the things that become most important in our life. And the long-term consequences of this, as we'll see in this letter, is that we begin to be swayed and carried away by falsehoods, by errors. It's how we see friends who have grown up in the church begin to be carried away by false teaching and by heresy because their eyes got off the cross and growing in these virtues. And their eyes became fixed on themselves and what they needed out of the church. We'll soon find ourselves a long way off from where we were called to. And no longer walking with Christ, we'll be walking with the world. We'll latch on to half-truths that make us feel good or, or half-truths that help us to blame others so it's not our fault. And yet if we look at the cross, what do we remember? It's actually all our fault. God loved us enough that he died for us because it was our fault that we were separated from him. This idea of being led astray by false teaching, by half-truths, by false teachers, is at the heart of what this letter is going to be about over the next few weeks. And so Peter begins here. He declares all that God has done for us. That he's given us everything we need. And he says, out of that, now work to supplement your faith that you might stand firm in the midst of a world calling you away from faithfulness. And as you do, not only will you show the world the good news of the gospel, but you will confirm in your own life the work of God. Take a look at verses 10 through 11. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Jesus, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As I've learned to just glory in these two books, Peter does exactly what he's always done for us. He fixes our eyes on the thing that is to come, on the eternal kingdom that is to come, on, on eternal life with Christ, on this inheritance that God has for us. And he says, walk faithfully in light of that. Knowing that your entrance into heaven has been provided for you, that is a passive voice because it's something that God has already done. That entrance into heaven is not based on anything we do. It is not based on these virtues. It is based on the sacrifice of Christ. So he says, that has been provided for you, and you have this future hope. And that's the, the future tense here, that we have a promise of salvation and eternal life with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so in light of that, he says, be all the more diligent. Don't stop paying attention to this. Make every effort to confirm your calling and election. That is, show the fruit of the new life you've been given in Christ. Show the joy and the fruit of the gospel lived out through virtue and godliness and brotherly affection and love and steadfastness. Peter says, if you practice these things, if, if you're working at them, if you're growing in them, if you're progressing and doing these better each and every day, they're going to keep you from falling away from your faith. That's my prayer for me. That's my prayer for us. That's my prayer for our kids as they go back to school and our, our college students go back to college. Lord, may you keep them from falling away from their faith. 
So convinced is Peter from having walked with Jesus for nearly three decades through difficult times in this letter that he says, I am going to tell you these things until it's my very last breath. Take a look at 12 through 15. Therefore, Peter says, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have, I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of a reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Peter exhorts and calls us up to the truth that they already know. He says, I'm not telling you anything new. I just know, like me, you are prone to forget the things you know and to live in light of them. He says, I don't want you to forget it. I don't want you to lose heart. Every Monday I meet with a group of men to talk through the upcoming passage. It's a great chance for accountability for me and to hear from their perspective what God's learned. And so this last Monday was Andy Garcia, the student pastor, student, yeah, student pastor and I, and we met. And as you know, Andy was up here a couple weeks ago preaching. And as we talked through this passage, we reminded each other of what our call is on Sunday mornings. When we have the opportunity to open God's word with you to preach, our call is not to bring you something new. Our call is not to bring you something novel. Our call is not to stir your imaginations in some creative way. No, it's actually much more boring than that. Our call is to remind ourselves and you all of the things we already know. To remind us of, of, of the cross and of all that Jesus Christ has done for us, of the glorious news of the gospel, and the great opportunity we have now to live as God's people in light of that truth. Like Peter, our call is to remind and stir one another up to do the things we already know to do. And so in recognition that this may be his final letter, notice what Peter says in verse 15. I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. Notice that he uses the same calling of himself that he puts on us. At the very beginning of this passage, he said, make every effort to supplement your faith, and I will make every effort to remind you that this is worthwhile. So important is it to Peter that he will do it until he sees Jesus face to face. Well, church, we're going to turn here shortly to a time of communion to celebrate the, the faith and the righteousness, the new life and the promises that we didn't earn, that we didn't deserve, that God gave us through faith in Jesus Christ. And we're going to remember the glorious good news that there is a day ahead of us that we will take this meal with our Savior face to face. That even as we take communion, we are declaring the two truths that Peter's reminding us of, of all that Christ did on the cross and the future hope that we have of celebrating that with him one day. And in light of that, as we supplement our life with these virtues, we might be the people God's called us to be. Let's go ahead and take the elements. If you'll hold on to them, and we'll take them together here shortly. Um, I want to encourage you, as we pass the elements, as we wait and remember, spend some time reflecting on all that Christ has done for you. Fix your eyes on the cross. If you happen to have your kids with you this morning, I, I want to encourage you to, something, to do something that Laura and I have done. When we first started doing it, it felt awkward because we thought we'd distract other people. Spend some time telling your kids why you're taking communion. Why is this something that matters to you as a follower of Christ? Uh, it can be as simple as, hey, kids, do you know what the bread means? Do you know what the blood means? Why? Why do we celebrate this? So take this moment to reflect on all that Christ has done and to reflect on all uh, that we have, the hope we have in him.
I'm going to ask you to hold on these for just a second. I'm going to walk us through an, uh, something else in the text, um, but I want us to do it as we're holding these elements. So in verses 13 and 14 in our translation, we get this really unique perspective. I think it right as long as I am in this body to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that putting off my body will be soon. In mentioning his body, Peter is, is talking about this life he's living between what Christ has done and this future hope he has of seeing Christ face to face. Today, as you hold these elements of, of the juice and the bread, you do so in this in-between time. And the heart and the call for all of us is to live in this in-between time in light of the truth of the gospel. So the thing that I think is really unique in this passage that we miss in the English is the next slide. The word used for body here is actually tent. We have translated it body so that we get a sense of what he means. But the idea here is that Peter recognizes that he is in this life in a temporary way, and he's about to close up shop. He's about to roll up his tent. He's about to be done with this life and, and, and go on to eternal life. And as we take and remember Christ in communion today, we are tent. There is a day we will roll up our tent, we will be done with this life, and we will spend eternity with Christ. And it's my heart, and I believe it's the heart of all of us in here, that we would spend our time in this tent, as it were, this temporary life that we have in, in grand scheme of eternity, walking faithfully with Christ. So as we take communion this morning, I want us to keep that in mind, that as we recognize all that Christ has done, we live in light of it. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, uh, he was with his disciples, and they were eating, and he, and he took bread, and, and he, after blessing it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. He then took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And in that moment, Jesus reminded his disciples of what was coming and the truth of what would happen through his body and his blood. But Matthew tells us in the very next bir birth, the very next verse, that Jesus went on to say this I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit and this vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Church, we have just partaken in a meal with our Savior that one day we will take with our Savior. And my hope is that for each and every one of us, he would be able to look at us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. Lord, I want to be, well, I am overjoyed and so grateful for all that you've done. But Lord, that is always tempered with this a great sense of humility. That, Lord, you've given me new life in Christ, that you've given me righteousness in Christ, that you have given me faith, that you have given me um, precious and very great promises, that your Holy Spirit lives inside me, not because of anything I've done, but because of your great love for me. Lord, that's true of every single person in this room who's placed their faith in you. So, Lord, we thank you for this chance to, to take communion, to remember Christ, what you have done, and the hope we have of seeing you again. We thank you for Peter's letter. And I would just pray for myself and each one of us as we live in these temporary tents that one day we'll get rolled up and we'll move on to eternity with you. Lord, help us to make every effort to supplement our faith with these virtues that we might be the men and women you desire for us to be. Thank you that you've not left us on our own. You've given us your word, you've given us your spirit, and you've given us this body, the church, to walk through life with. We're so grateful. Please pray all these things in the name of our Savior, our Lord, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Would you stand and join us as we sing our closing song together this morning? is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest ring, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fills his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. 
In every high and stormy year, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Results. His oath is covered and His blood support me in the overwhelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. When he shall come, when he shall come with trumpet sound, who may I then in him be found? Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Again, it's great to see you this morning and worship with you at Cornerstone. We'll look forward to seeing you all next time. You're dismissed. Have a great day.